Okay. Greetings and good afternoon to all and the ones in the Pacific Coast. Good morning. Thank you for accepting our invitation to another webinar that HEADS had coordinated for this semester. This time, the title of the webinar is Student Retention Through Online Faculty and Student Learning Impact on Hispanic Students. And today we have the pleasure to have invite a, our speaker today is Dr. Delaine Siren from California State University, Sacramento. Uh, thank you, uh, Delaine, for your valuable collaboration with this initiative to help us support the faculty, administrators, and students as part of the HEADS mission to promote the integration of technology into higher education. Today, we have more than 300 people registered, and so far, 120 have been able to connect, 21 right now. So uh, we are so happy to uh, have you here. And those more than 300 participants registered are from more than 20 higher education institutions in Puerto Rico, including schools from the Department of Education in Puerto Rico. Also, we have participants from more than seven institutions in the U.S., uh, mostly heads member institutions. We already say hi to Hill, uh, to Julio from Hill College, our one of our newest members. But we have others from Sacramento as well, a colleague of 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 Delane, and also we have others from New York and and Texas, and also we have registered from Latin America. A, a, a one of our member institute on Ruminawi in Ecuador. Hopefully uh, they can join us on time because sometimes it's kind of confused the time zone. So hopefully uh, they will join us as well. And also we have some others from organizations that are also interested in this topic. So greetings to all. We hope that this webinar will be of great benefit to everyone. Before we start the webinar, we would like to share a few things. It's, it's the same announcements that we do in every webinar, but since probably some of you are new, we would like to again highlight this. How can you benefit from this webinar? But first of all, use the chat, not only to put your name and your institution, but also to share your, your questions and comments. I will be reading loud uh, your questions either comments or questions when we have at the end the Q&A session, or if you have any doubt during the presentation, Delaine, you let me know if you are okay, if I can interrupt you so you can clarify. And she said yes, so no problem. Uh, we are using the feature of that Zoom provide us as, as host to keep your microphone mute, but sometimes this feature uh, Bella, is not Bella, so real, reliable so if you can unmute your sale please avoid to do it to avoid any interruptions during the recording of this webinar so if you see that you can unmute please keep it mute okay we will really appreciate that also uh, remember that in the in the chat you will find the link to request your certificate of participation or you can use also uh, your, if you are in a laptop or a PC, you can use your mobile to scan the QR code to request the certificate. I always mention this, but always we have some bounds when we try to send the certificate. So please make sure to put your email uh, cor uh, de la correct so you can be able to receive your certificate before you said uh, you say, uh, press submit. Make sure you have your name and your email correct spell. Thank you so much. Also, remember that after we finish the webinar, you will receive, receive an email with the link to complete a short electronic evaluation to help us uh, continue enhancing the webinars and also help us identify which head services and initiative can support not only you, as faculty and administrator, but also your students, and which are the best ways to promote these services. This survey is anonymous, and the estimate time to complete it is, on, is around five minutes. So we will really appreciate your time to complete this survey. 
because your feedback is very important to us. And also feel free to send us email if there is something that you may want to communicate. Feel free to send us an email to info.heads.org. Finally, we would like to uh, invite you to help us spread the word and invite others to register and participate in other in our webinars and events. Next ones, remember that you can go to the Heads ORG website and then in next events or in the in the main uh, uh, homepage, you can find the next events. And uh, next week, we will have a, from March 12 to 15, the Heads Academy. This is uh, this academy, the, the, the name is Learning Technology and Leadership Academy, and the main purpose is to develop the next generation of leaders in learning and technology. The, the persons that will be participating already submit their application. We are in the process of evaluating, and tomorrow we're going to select the participants who will be attending next week week so we are very excited of, of, of this so next week we're going to be very busy with the Heads Academy and hopefully if you don't have the time this time to participate remember that we try to offer at least one per semester uh, the Heads Academy so you keep tuned to see if you can join us in the next one if you couldn't join us this time also we will have another their webinar. Uh, this time, we're going to talk about opportunities to stand out and contribute to the health of Hispanic and Latino communities across the country. This time, we're going to have Missy Cardona from Chief the National Program Lead Portfolio Management from American Heart Association. She has a very interesting, not only information, but opportunities for students and faculty to share. So don't miss this webinar. In it's going to be Thursday, March. March 21 from 3 to 4. This time we, the next Sunday, the time change and Puerto Rico will be again Eastern Standard Time. So it's going to be from 3 to 4. Okay. And it's going to be on Zoom. Also, the ones who like to share your expertise with a global audience, you can explore and send a, 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 a excuse me, and send what happened that this uh, change and send us uh, a, a, your article. You still have time. The deadline is Friday, March 20, excuse me, 29. Uh, yeah, March 29 is the deadline. So you still have time to download the guidelines uh, and write your articles, no more than 15 pages. So you can share this and be able to uh, share your expertise with not only our heads, member institutions, but also others who read our journal. And in May, in May 10, we are gonna have again Dr. Gabriel Paisi, professor. He's a professor from Sacred Heart University in Puerto Rico, and he will be talking about a tech, effective a communication techniques for this digital a, era. So this is gonna be done in the morning, it's a Friday, May 10 from 10 to 11 Eastern time. And we have other webinars coming in April and May. So stay tuned. So you don't miss the opportunity uh, to join us. Also, we, uh, we would like to again highlight the unlimited access to the Peterson test spread databases that are in the Student Placita. In this one, you can find scholarship practice tests and ebook to prepare for those tests, such as PCAT, ELSA, GRE, among others. Remember that uh, to uh, access the database, you visit the Student Placita, click on the link of the Peterson test spread. And if you don't don't if you don't know the password uh, to enter the database, send us an email with the name of your institutions, and we will be providing this password. Okay. Likewise, the, you have unlimited access to the Peterson Career Prep, and this one particular database is more into search for jobs, internships, create your resume, and find career advice, among other resources. And again, visit the Student Placita and click on the Peterson Career Prep link uh, to access the database. Let me tell you that they finally 
heroes and now they have the menu in Spanish as well. So please feel free, although they test and some of the resources still in English, but the menu to navigate the database is in Spanish. So we invite you to take advantage of this new feature. And now uh, we are ready to start our webinar today, but first I would like to read a brief summary of Dr. Delaine Sirene. Dr. Delaine Sirene is a, an emeritus faculty member of California State University, Sacramento. While at this institution, Dr. Sirene was a faculty member in the Department of Psychology, and her research area of interest is behavioral neuroscience with an emphasis of the bi biological basis of age and sex differences in risk-taking and sensation-seeking behavior. Over the years, Dr. Shireen introduced many psych psychology students to the use and joy of statistics in behavioral science. And Dr. Sirene was also quite active in shared governance and the Center for Teaching and Learning at her institution and as a faculty associate and mentor. Dr. Sirene continues to work with the Center for Teaching and Learning to examine the impact of professional development on student success. And finally, after receiving her, her master's degree in psychology in 2000, 2007, she obtained her PhD in psychology from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. So thank you. Let me stop sharing. Sirene. Uh, I did stop sharing, but nothing happened. Okay, now. Okay. Yeah. No, still sharing. It's okay. Still sharing? Okay, but hold on for a second. Let me let me go back and I don't know why. I think I can stop sharing on this end. Uh, yeah, please. Okay. Because I don't know why. Ah, okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Montavo. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning from the West Coast and buenas tardes or good afternoon to those of you in the East. Um, as Dr. Montalvo said, um, my name is Delaine Seren, and I am retired from Sac State or Sacramento State as of last year, and uh, I'm having fun getting ready to go hiking in the um, Portugal and Santiago Trail next month. So wish me luck on that. Um, I'm going to talk today about student retention through online faculty and student learning, documenting, and measuring the impact on Hispanic students. And this is a collaboration with myself, Andres Enriquez from the CAMP program, which I'll talk more about, Praveen Maduri, who is here today, as well as Lynn Tashiro, the director of our Center for Teaching and Learning. So a little bit of context about our institution. Alex uh, is California State University, Sacramento. It's a public university. Uh, there's 23 campuses in the California State University system. We like to call ours also Sacramento State University. It has about 30,000 students, and it's been a Hispanic-serving institution since 2016. And some of the project components I'll be talking about will be the student tutorial online learning, college assistant migrant program, the faculty professional development, as well as STEM and GE course redesign. So again, today's plan is to look at the, uh, the data and evidence on how students specifically Hispanic students, are measurably impacted by the online learning tutorial, which we called Hornet Learning Online 101. Then we'll talk about the technology loan program, which is through our CAMP program and the CAMP technology program, our faculty professional development, which we call faculty learning communities, and then course redesign for our STEM and GE general education courses. So as a response to the transition from um, in-person teaching to online teaching as a result of the COVID pandemic in 2020, we came up with a student tutorial called Hornet Learning Online 101. It's a one hour optional tutorial and it was designed to help students transition from um, in-person to online learning. And it's not just for that now, It's um, good for every modality. So we continue to ask students to um, 
sign up to take it. It's delivered self-paced online. It's using uh, Canvas, which is our learning management system, and it helps them navigate their courses. And it's designed with a growth mindset that students can do this. As part of it, we have an online learning readiness survey, and I'll be talking about some of the results to that in just a moment. But it also offers a comprehensive directory for tutoring, advising, mentoring, basic needs, and so on for our students so they can find what they need in order to succeed. And lately, we've added a module on using artificial intelligence or AI in helping students work with that. So the impact on Hispanic students, um, we'll look at a little bit more closely. Over the four years since this was launched in 2020, in fall 2020, we've had about 9,480 students uh, complete the survey, but we've had a lot more students actually participate. One of the small problems is that the students may take the course but not actually complete the survey, so this number might actually be underestimated. And in addition, some students take it over multiple semesters. We've had about 400 students take it multiple times, and that might be because their faculty members are asking that they um, complete this course as a extra credit or a bonus for the class. But what we're looking at is on the right, the demographics of this, the breakdown, and the sample of our survey reasonably matches what's going on with our campus. And 3,812 students, or about 40.2%, self-identified as Hispanic. So there's the self-report versus the IPEDS data, which is the Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System, and we're able to access some of that information as well. So this online learning readiness survey uh, has 21 questions on computer skills, time management, and academic skills. And the responses were linked to the students' IDs as well as the campus demographics um, files. So again, the students were self-identifying uh, their demographic, um, race and ethnicity, whether they were first generation, their gender, the cohort, and we were able to match that up with what the university had indicated. And we disaggregated the responses by ethnicity as well as uh, first generation status and so on. And we analyzed it for differences between the different ethnic groups. So the Hispanic students, we also looked at whether or not they were first generation, whether neither parent attended college at all, first generation status, whether neither parent earned a two or four year degree, but one or both may have attended college, first generation status where neither parent attended college at all, and first generation status where neither parent earned a two or four year degree, but one or both may have attended college. So some of the examples of the questions on this survey were, I can toggle between two open software applications on my computer. I have access to someone who can help me with computer challenges. I can set aside a regular five to eight hours per week to devote to an online class. And looking at this data a little bit more, the, the responses were on a zero to uh, three scale, zero being not applicable, one disagree, two neutral, three agree, and left blank is, is no response. And so categorizing the averages for those, we consider a strength if the mean were uh, was 2.75, and we highlighted those in green. The challenges, the means are less than or equal to 2.5, and we highlighted those in orange. And overall, we looked at the number of strengths categories versus the number of challenges, the green versus the orange. And you can see that on the table, the orange lines are the ones, again, where students might have some challenges. The green lines are where the students might have some um, strengths. And at the bottom, we've got the comparison for the different groups, the number of strengths and the number of um, challenges that they might have. Yes. Uh, yes, I have a question in the chat from Dr. Gabriela. Mm -hmm. Uh, Graciela, sorry, uh, she asked, did you develop the readiness survey or base it on an assistive survey? Did you have reference? We want to develop I'm a similar survey not sure. I think it, our campus. Uh -huh. Oh, I think it was something that was self-developed looking at some of the challenges that our students had. I can't answer that completely because I was not um, making up this. I was just in the back end analyzing the data. But that's a great question, and I'll be happy to find it out and get back to you on that. Um, but I'm also happy to share this readiness survey if anyone would like that as well. 
So we looked at some of the strengths for Hispanic students specifically, where there was regular actable computer, they were good at prioritizing responsibilities and following written instructions. Some of the challenges were having someone to help them with computer challenges, managing their time and participating in live class discussions. And we'll look at the possible reasons for that in just a moment. The Hispanic students overall had eight areas of strengths and five areas of challenges compared to 14 areas of strength and one area of challenges for white students. So something different is going on Hispanic students are self-assessing as being a little less prepared for uh, university. So looking at the why, uh, instead of just the what is happening, we focused on our CAMP program. Now our CAMP program means College Assistance Migrant Program. And the 23-24 cohort has 85 students. It's a federally funded program designed to serve students from migrant and seasonal farm working backgrounds and help them succeed at Sac State, more or less facilitating the transition from high school and to college, and then offers first year support services to develop skills necessary to persist and graduate from college in a timely manner, a home away from home, if you will. For US citizens or permanent residents, a student, parent, or guardian must. time sharply during the remote online instruction from fall 20 to spring 22. And you can see that the cohorts of um, the camp were um, graduating at a, a, a much higher rate, but also uh, they were impacted by this. And we wanted to find out why this is going on. So some of the challenges to access to technology, we saw that students had access to computer, but we'll talk more about that. But what about that access to a high end speed internet connection? The majority of our camp students come from rural areas where there's no reliable internet access. And during the pandemic, we had students who had hotspots, but they also would come in and just sit in our garage where Wi-Fi was still available. Access to someone who can help with computer challenges. Understanding that great many of our students are first generation and live at home, Therefore, they may not have someone who they can turn to for help in their household to help with computer problems. Also managing time. The majority of the students have jobs and we have a very diverse population and, and diverse needs. So anytime they had available, they use it to work and put less time into their studies. Also setting aside a regular five to eight hours per week to devote to an online class. So some of the challenges with this is that the students said that their parents do not understand why they're spending so much time online because online to them meant, you know, social media or, you know, just surfing or playing games and urging the students to find a job. So the camp counselors actually met with some of the parents to explain the nature of online classes and the importance for their sons or daughters to continue their studies online. And so to many parents, again, physical labor was work passive computer use was not perceived as work. So some additional insights were that um, even what appeared to be strengths for the Hispanic students proved to have challenges. They talked about the access to a reliable computer. So although 94% of the Hispanic students reported having regular access to a reliable computer in the CAMP program, they observed students trying to take engineering final exams, for example, on their mobile phones and other students without computers, despite access to a campus computer loan program. And so we had an aha moment, our campus computer loan program that was started during the, the pandemic and that transition required a faculty member to put in a request for the student to our IT department in order for that um, computer to be checked out. And they were checked out for a semester at a time. And a lot of times, even during finals week, the last week of classes, they were starting to ask for those computers back, maybe when students were needing them the most. And so we, because of that, instead of going through the central unit, we decided to come up with a technology program in fall 2023. The first phase of this is to fund through the National Science Foundation, a laptop loan program where we had 50 computers designated for the CAMP program. And that facilitated long-term computer loan for one year or more 
through the camp program from the camp staff, students know and trust. So it's the students, that, that the people that they've been working with. And currently there were nine computers on long-term loan for our students. The short-term computer loans inside the camp center are also available where students can check them out and work on the academic work with the support of peers as well as the camp staff. And there's 15 computers available at any time for short-term checkout. And at least 10 to 12 of those are used at any given day at every time. Okay, so that's an average of 50, 60 checkouts per week. And here's just a, a nice picture of some of our students working in the camp program, working together and working on some of those computers. And just a quick shout out to the NSF STEM Zone grant, the uh, Lynn Tashiro and um, Mary McCarthy are the PIs, as well as our Tech for Equity with Lynn Tashiro and Praveen Maduri, who's here today with us. Okay, so that was the camp program and the technology aspect. Let's look at the faculty professional development, how that can help work on the impact on students' grades. And so the assumption here is that enhancing instruction through professional development improves student learning and grades. We're basing this on the theory of change, which is a project specific and related to evaluation. So it makes the rationale of a project explicit, supporting the planning, the implementation, and the assessment. And so it makes a clearer connection between the intervention and the outcomes. So it allows us for finding out under what conditions does something work and for whom. And when we're looking at the research gap where there's limited measures of impact of professional development on student outcomes in higher education, such as on grades and on retention. So the question that we looked at was specifically focused on the STEM fields because of their special needs during the pandemic with being online. So can faculty professional development make a measurable impact on student course grades in STEM? And we compared, first of all, the fall 2019 and the fall 2020. These are the ones that we concentrated for on this because the fall 2019 was fairly stable in person. The fall 2020 was beginning to be a little bit more stable online. The spring 2020, as you know, was back and forth and time off and everybody was trying to learn how to do college at that point in time in a new way. So we looked at some of our data sources of institutional faculty, student course and demographic data, and we looked at program completion data on two different types of professional development programs that were offered during the summer of 2020. So the two different general uh, responses, we had a general uh, professional development, which is a response to the pandemic, and we had over 750 participants in that. So it's about getting the courses online, which is different from delivering quality online instruction. And it was using our um, learning management system or Canvas. A lot of our faculty had not been using it before this need arose for it having to be used um, for online teaching. And it had um, cohorts of 30. It was three weeks, asynchronous online, and the STEM faculty didn't react very positive to that because it didn't address their specific needs, labs and uh, other types of instruction that are typically more hands-on. So we developed an additional sidecar, if you will, for the STEM participants, uh, for labs, demonstrations of proficiency, examination needs, where we can engage the students online, engineering, natural sciences, and math. We had 68 participants seven small groups, and it was over six weeks with some synchronous online time as well as some asynchronous work. And for this, the faculty responded positively. And we've since included this study in the participation in subsequent faculty learning communities aimed at helping faculty engage students both in online and in person environments. So we've been expanding it beyond this time, but this gave us a good way to get the comparison of the impact of different kinds of professional development. Oops, excuse me. And so this is our difference in difference analysis. And we'll have a test on this at the end of the presentation. But you know, again, I do like statistics, but if you're interested in this, this was the method that we looked at for analyzing our results to see whether or not there was an impact that was different for our general professional development compared to our STEM professional development and whether or not both of them compared to the people that had no professional development at all. So we found that the when we matched the courses and the faculty, those who taught before and after COVID, so both in the fall 19 and the fall 2020, 
we found differences from the general and the no professional development. You can see that the no professional development is the bottom line, the solid line. The top line are the people that were in the STEM professional development. And the people, or I'm sorry, the top line is the ones that were in the general professional development. And then the middle uh, line that's kind of intersecting the both are the people that were in the STEM specific professional development. And so we looked again at the prior professional development. We looked at the instructors, whether they were tenured or tenure track versus the lectures. We looked at the combination of the courses for lower division versus upper division courses. And we we're trying to get at why there might be a difference from the beginning point of the general and um, the STEM and the no PD faculty in their grades, the average grades for the courses. And we found though that the STEM participants course grades rose significantly more than those of the non-participants. And part of the reason we're getting at this and we're still exploring that a little bit more might be the requirements of the faculty. Perhaps they had greater needs and the additional um, STEM specific professional development was of a greater benefit to them as well as to their students. In addition, a lot of our courses in the majors require a C or a C minus or better in order to count towards the degree. So our general professional development participants, DFW, those students who received a D, an F, or a W, which would then have to repeat the course, or you know, the students might drop out or change majors, um, actually started out lower for those of the STEM PD participants and the non-participants. And again, that's just the opposite of what we found in the last one. They're hand in hand. There's a correlation between those. And we found that the general professional development participants DFW rate decreased the same amount as those of the non-participants. Again, that's the top line and the bottom line on this graph. But the STEM participants DFW rate decreased significantly more than those of the non-participants. So this is all indication that perhaps the STEM professional development spoke more to the faculty and helped them transition to a more online um, teaching program, as well as helping their students succeed even more than just the general uh, professional development. We did look at the um, equity gap in the course grades, and we didn't find any difference between them as far as um, the URM and non-URM students, all the um, in grades increased across all the groups. You can see on the left, the no treatment, the general pro uh, professional development, and the STEM professional development. And we're still looking at this a little bit more and looking at some specific ethnic groups to see um, how it might change a little bit differently. But we did look at it in a little bit more in the DFW rates. In the no treatment and the general pro um, professional development, the difference in the DFW rates at the beginning versus the end for the URM went up slightly, not significantly higher, and it did drop a little bit for the non-URM students. But you can see in the STEM PD, for both groups, it decreased significantly. Okay, So we were able to lower the DFW rates, and again, that means that more students were succeeding in these courses, not having to repeat the courses, which takes extra time and extra money in order to complete their degrees. So what made it effective? We found it was discipline specific, um, also implements and models adult learning theory, structures authentic collaboration among faculty, models effective curricular planning and teaching practices, provides coaching and expert support, includes time for intentional reflection, and occurs over a sustained duration. Again, each of these courses, they were in small groups uh, faculty cohorts of about 30. They had um, people working with them, facilitators to guide them through the instruction. And they also worked together with each other in discussion boards and feedback on how to help each other get through the pandemic. We also found out that faculty were more likely to participate when there was an online guided asynchronous portion that began over the summer. They could then take the course within that six to eight week window and then actually try the techniques they learned in the fall. So that the summer would prepare them while they're still designing their courses, and then they can incorporate those changes in the actual, the fall when the courses actually start. We also started implementing peer-led observe and analyze sessions with about three to four faculty members, as well as a facilitator, where we'd have 30 minutes 
where each faculty member would present a two to three minute demo video and then receive warm and cool feedback from the other faculty members that were there as well as the facilitators. And that worked out very well. They could see that they were not alone in some of the challenges and what they were doing well was well received. And there's a lot of ideas exchanged during those observe and analyze sessions. And of course it didn't hurt that there was additional stipends available for completion. And during the pandemic and during this, this summer camp and so on, the um, Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund helped fund some of those additional stipends. So we do provide some additional funds for attending these courses. So I've got a couple of examples of specific faculty members that allowed us to share this where we looked over time, how they've done and what kind of changes they've made in their course. Um, so in this one, the changes in the course you can see where the um, the means of this particular faculty member, which are in the blue, versus the means for the other courses that were similar, um, and the differences in this Physics 11A. And this is specifically for the Hispanic student grades. And yes, go ahead. And we have another question mm -hmm. from Graciela as well. How was, espérate, first a comment that say how wonderful to see how collected data uh, lead to support to more effective methods to support students. E the question is, was all the PD done in in-house or were there opportunities to take PD from other providers third party? Ah, mira, so, pero Praden, 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 I think, oh, sorry, I didn't see that Praden, uh, Praden uh, reply and also oh, okay. provide the stipends. I'm probably surprised. So sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. That's a great question, Annie. Just in case you're not watching the chat, um, the camp and the Thank STEM PD were were based upon um, some other campuses. Uh, professional development. So we incorporated that. You know, it was very quick. We had to get that online very quickly. But that was done in house. Since then, we've started to use uh, courses through AQ, uh, the Association of College University Education Educators. And they have pre-packaged micro-credential micro -credential courses, which are the asynchronous portion that our students work on over six to eight weeks during the spring and summer. And then the in-house stuff with the on um, in-person observe and analyze sessions, as well as uh, portfolio uh, process is all done in-house. And we have a culminating event at the end of every semester in December and in May, where all the faculty participants that have completed faculty learning communities during that last year or last semester uh, present their portfolios and we, you know, they get a chance to share that with others from um, the community of our university as well as administrators, our provost or president on occasion does come in and see what great work our faculty are up to. But that's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, and in this one, we can see going back to uh, this one person, again, the blue lines compared to the orange lines, some of the changes that happened here is you can see where this um, major requirements, the computer science or the, um, the major requirements changed where the physics courses were open to not just students in the major, but also being able to add other majors. And so that's why there were some differences in grades upon that time. As well as the beginning, there were some increases where we went into a peer led team learning also called PAL or peer assisted learning, which helps students work together. And that PAL is something I'm not going to really talk about, but that's another program that we do where students are trained to work with um, their peers. And instead of giving them the answers, they will then help them find the answers on, the own, on their own. So a lot of the questions that they're asking are leading questions to help the students find the answers themselves. And indeed the peer assisted learning team will not give them the correct answer but it helped them figure it out on their own. So you can see that there has been some benefit there for this particular faculty member compared to the other courses in the same way. The second faculty member that is allowing us to share um, tried a lot of different techniques without really assessing the effectiveness. Now he's an enthusiastic professor, um, but it's really hard to measure what works when you're trying a lot of different things. And you can see that in the um, text below where we've got the first time teaching a course, first time using Canvas, uh, developing the asynchronous courses, the asynchronous COVID times, and, and hybrid and revisions. And, and so a lot of things were incorporated, but it makes it really hard. And that's why we're stressing the importance of our 
program to really assess what does work and having that general versus the STEM specific versus a control group has been helpful to pick apart what works for um, professional development. And with that, and again, it's going to be a little bit short, but I do want to acknowledge some people, uh, Marianne Wong, Judy Kuznick, and Mary McCarthy Heinz, who are working on the STEM for Equity and the STEM Zone grants, our National Science Foundation, our grant numbers are there, as well as the STEM Zone Faculty Development Program, U.S. Department of Education, which is the Developing Hispanic Serving Institution and STEM Hispanic Serving Institution grants STEM for Equity. And then we have researchers, um, Dizu and Sabrina Solanke, who helped us with those statistics from the University of California, Irvine, in kind of overseeing our research. And with that, I think I'd like to say thank you and open it up if there's any additional questions. Okay, excellent. I see other comments uh, in the chat that it says, first of all, the instrument that you see, that's medium. This oh, stipends, yeah, Raven answered about this stipends, right? And then Dr. Yeah, the primary Jerez, funding for, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, the primary funding during the transition was from the, the HER funding, the higher education refunding. And since then, we've been using these grants to fund some additional um, professional development, as well as the stipends are going on. And we get a lot of interest in these courses. Okay, and then Dr. Miria Jerez, talk about the instrument that you use for obtaining the data was in English and other question. Do you know if Spanish students are proficiency in English language? Oh, good question. Um, I'm not really sure on that. I know that Andres, who is working with our camp students, might have a better idea. But again, um, we're hoping that our students, in order to succeed, are proficient in the English language. A lot of them are first generation, but they're mm -hmm. from California. So they're usually more proficient in the English language than maybe their parents we see that and unfortunately a lot of them unfortunately speak only english and not necessarily spanish but uh i don't think that's been a problem all our materials though are in english but if a student requested it in another language i'm sure we'd be able to accommodate them also dr guzman asked do the stem courses have math and english free courses? yes the stem courses do have math um, I'm not sure, but English English might be part of the GE program. Uh, the first two years where the students are taking that general, there are some components that have an English requirement. Um, I see there was another question about the labs, whether yeah. they were in person yeah. or online. And during the time of transition, we were able to offer some of the labs still in person, but again, with a lot of social distancing and instead of um, you know, just meeting once a week, we're having additional labs where there might be only 10 or five students in a lab at a time when this is going on. And people had to apply in order to continue doing them in person, you know, with chemistry and so on. It might be a little bit easier to do them in person. But what we were incorporating with some of this STEM specific professional development are some of the alternatives like Labster in order to do these in an online environment as well as to engage the students that way. So it was really up to what the professor felt comfortable doing as well as what they felt was best for their students. And then there's also some things about the um, evaluation process and some questions that were going on there where you know, should we have cameras to watch the students taking the exams or can we trust them or can we design the um, assessments so that they deter cheating and it's, it's more um, based upon competencies rather than you know just taking off a box. Uh, <laughs> Foreman <laughs> and some of assessments. I got to that right before that, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, that was a that was a big thing. And and then you think about it as far as equity, um, equitable practices requiring a student to have a camera on. We don't know what's going on in a student's household. We don't know mm -hmm. if there's like ten people behind them, um, if they're what their environment is, uh, whether they have the ability to have a good connection. So therefore, there was a lot of debate and. Our faculty uh, senate at that point in time was working on not requiring the students to have a camera on while teaching mm -hmm. because it was better uh, we couldn't require it. But that came into a problem with some of the engineering courses and some of the STEM courses that really wanted to make sure that the students were not cheating on those exams. 
So there was a lot of back and forth, plus the, the cost for students to be monitored for taking that kind of exam. So part of our um, instruction was to help design assessments that could better reflect what the students were learning rather than being very punitive in that case. Este, I see that Professor Marian eh, Toledo was confused with the time zone. Remember that Puerto Rico doesn't change the time zone. So that means when, that when the East Coast eh, put their clock one hour ahead, we are the same hour. So three o'clock Atlantic time, that is the time that we are, are the, the, the one yeah, that Yeah, I think it's four say, hours difference right now. Is, Exactly. In the yeah. Eastern East, mm -hmm. 2 p.m. No, we are one hour. They are one hour. Well, no, we are one hour ahead. 3 p.m. is 2 p.m. Eastern time. And in the promo, we always, since we know it's confusing, uh, <laughs> when we have the kind of uh, time zones differences, we put it in the promo. A, a Atlantic time, Puerto Rico time, and then 2 p.m. Eastern time. I double checked right. the promo and it was correct. So I'm so sorry. Professor Marianne, that you just arrived, but don't worry, everything has been recorded and you can go to the HEADS website in Next and Past Events. You will find first the next events and then at the bottom of the page, you will have the record recording of all of our prior webinars, including this one. And also the presentation, you can download it uh, as well. So don't worry about it. Uh, Isaris, just uh, put be, below your comment, uh, the comment of Mary Toledo, uh, put the link to request the certificate este, here. So please make sure you put your name and email correct. Uh, déjame ver, uh, uh, they are, Melinda is asking, can we, Please have your email for further questions. Are you talking to me or talking to Delaine? Melinda. I'm happy to answer any questions if you wish to email me. It's my name, uh, the D-E hyphen L-A-I-N-E dot C-Y-R-E-N-N-E -N -N -E, as it's written up there at C-S-U-S dot E-D-U. And if, if you can put it in the chat, the email of Delaine, because I guess it's for her because you already have our emails. So, Isari, you can put it because your name, Delaine, is kind of... <laughs> yeah, I have the email at doctor and I put an email. ¿Cómo es? Okay, you have, you put the email on the chat? Okay. Yeah. I put okay. Name. Gracias, eh, Isari. And also we have a question for Dr. Eh, Guzman. How, how were formative and summative assessment proctor? I think I've mentioned that one, whether or not they were going to be in-person and so on. I see another okay, couple of questions. One about QM certification, quality matters certification. Uh -huh. yes. And our campus is very big on that. We do have additional grants that are looking at the impact of quality matters. We also have reviewers that have gotten certified through QM to review our online courses. And we have quite a few courses that are starting to get that certifying uh, using that rubric of quality matters um, and alignment and so on. And it's a really great program. I've been through several of the courses myself. And more and more instructors are seeing the benefit of that and incorporating that, again, not just for online teaching, but for developing their Canvas course in order to go forward in the future. Um, one of the things that we had in addition to the um, COVID pandemic, the previous year or the year or two before, we had fires. Uh, wildfires in California and the smoke the particulates were in the Sacramento area and necessitated closing campus for about two weeks. And this is before we had a plan in place to develop you know, online or continuous teaching during um, times like this. So I think we're much better prepared and QM helps us be prepared for having quality online instruction, not just getting the courses online. Did you also answer Lester Lopez? When you mention AI, how do you incorporate it? Uh, yes, delay. Delay. Okay, I see that Praveen put something in there and there are several uh -huh. professional development courses going on right now. This is like the first semester we've started really concentrating on the impacts of dealing with AI. That was in progress last semester, but it's really this semester we've got a lot of cohorts starting and looking at that. And so we hope to have some results on how to help the faculty and help the faculty help the students and the idea being to use AI and explain to students the good, the bad, 
and when it's appropriate to use it. Okay, great. Okay, it's 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 too fast here, and I have kind of, <laughs> a kind of delay. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Professor Marianne, you can uh, request the certificate now and and com commit yourself to see the the recording. So sorry, you uh, didn't have the right time. Our we are really sorry about the confusion. And they uh, is that put the delay uh, email over there. So please make sure if you have any questions, Delaine is very accessible. We truly appreciate your kindness and, and Bella sharing your expertise on that. So thank you so much. Uh, all I see here is thank you. Excellent, excellent presentation, excellent initiative. Thank you for sharing. Uh, so thank you so, so much. And mm -hmm. from Luciana, eh, mm -hmm. Susana said, tremenda presentación, so great presentation in English. <laughs> Gracias. <laughs> este, so, and I'd like to say yeah. thank you also for the hospitality when I was at the HETS um, conference yes. in January. And I had the, uh, the fortunate opportunity to spend an extra couple of weeks in Puerto Rico traveling around the entire island. And so okay. everybody was super friendly, you know, just loved it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. That's why we want to do this webinar. And not only because it was what you, you uh, were recognized with the track, all track winners, higher score when the uh, evaluation committee evaluate all the proposals received. So, but also because it was one of the most popular topic and we have a technical problem, program, excuse me, problem or issue with the recording at that time. And mm -hmm. now we have the whole presentation record. So we gonna, you will have access to this uh, for future references. And definitely it's a very interesting uh, approach and we really appreciate your useful information. And please, uh, if you have any other question, uh, you can email uh, Delaine or you can email us and we will be happy to hope forward it to her. Uh, or and to Praven and thank you Praven you were not able to come to Puerto Rico it was a we we hope that next time you can join us uh, and thank you so much for being uh, able to sharing the Vela answering the questions and helping me and also delay uh, to to reply all the questions uh, in the chat we truly appreciate that thank you so much any other question before we go no uh, is that is just put again the for more information uh, our our contact us where you can find our phone emails and everything and also uh, see if you can put uh, yeah she also put the the link to a uh, request the certificate uh, and remember that you will receive it if not during the weekend by Monday you will receive it. Okay, so please make sure uh, that you submit uh, the form with the correct name and email. Delaying, hope to have a nice uh, weekend. It's Thursday, but tomorrow is Friday, so we are almost there. But by the way, I don't know if in the US is also the Women's Day, uh, the celebration. So well, uh, congratulations to all women here in, in, in the chat and all the women, marvelous women that we know. Thank you for all that you do. And, and we hope you have a great day. And thank you again. Hopefully we will collaborate uh, again, uh, Delay. It will be a pleasure. And thank you again for your uh, excellent presentation. Again, uh, thank you. Likewise, thank you. thank you. Any other question? No, I'm going to stop the recording.